says it all. Here's my ambition. It's my goal. Here's my family. It's all yours. Take these lungs. Take this voice. Take this vessel. Wherever you want. Whatever you want. Whatever you want to bring. Sometimes faith will make you look crazy until it starts to rain. Oh. We're singing so beautifully, I surrender all. <laughs> and I heard in my heart, yeah, it looks good on paper. Sometimes we, we, get, we get so moved in our hearts, in our emotion. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to be moved. But when we're moved by God to actually surrender, that takes us into a place that doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's easy to surrender things that are easy to surrender. But it's the ones that where fear grips you. And, and you've encountered the living God and he's met you. And he asks you to, to surrender. Holy Spirit, burn within us. Hmm. Felt compelled to read this verse of scripture to you out of Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old receive their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. 
though he was commended, which was commended as righteousness, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And by this, he com- condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed, and he was called to go to a place that he was to receive as his inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, and heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking for a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah received power to conceive, even when she was past her age, since she considered him faithful who promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven. It goes on. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through him shall your offspring be named. And he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessing on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, was, when he was dying, blessed each of his sons, the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. You take my bones, boys, as I saw the land. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was growing up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea on the dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, of Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, and stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the power of fire. They escaped the the edge of the sword. They were made strong out of weakness and became mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. 
Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves, And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us that apart from us they would not be made perfect. Lord, bless your word. I stand here. I said to one of my friends the other day on the phone, I don't know about you, but I'm I'm a 1 Corinthians man. I am. I'm a surrendered man. I'm a conquered man. The train of his robe fills the temple and I've been swept up and carried in his robe. Carried in his victory. I'm undone. He has me. And the one thing the enemy doesn't want is for me to live as a surrendered, conquered man. Scares him. Paul said, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when I was with you, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He told me to write a few things down, and I want to read them to you. The things that are on his heart right now in this season are more important than the things on my mind. We notice that wineskins are changing, organizations are changing and shifting. The world is shifting and changing. Things don't look like they used to anymore. And the Lord instructed me and he said, it's not a time to look outwardly, but inwardly to the heart of the Father. The worship tonight, oh, <laughs> it was like he was, it was making the angels jealous because we are the affection of his eye. But things are changing. Someone asked me the other day about my eschatology. (laughs) What are your views on the end times? It was a great question. And I found myself saying something under the anointing of the Spirit, and I said, my best posture right now and the best posture I can have is not concentrating on how bad the earth is becoming or how great the task is ahead of us, but it's becoming more aware of the glory of God rising in the earth and becoming part of the greatest move of God in the kingdom of heaven. (laughs) Habakkuk 2 says, the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The ones in Hebrews 11 knew that inwardly. They were captured and marked by him in such a way that they weren't, they weren't even able, and even though they didn't recognize it, they, were, they weren't even able to receive what was promised that we would receive, but they still surrendered everything. And it wasn't surrender for a good idea or a cause. They weren't championing justice. 
They were surrendered to a person named Jesus. Even though they hadn't seen him, they believed in him. They were looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. There was something within them that when God visited them, they had to respond. They would be more miserable not responding than if they did respond and it looked terrible. There's something about that, that faith, that isn't an agreement to a good cause. But when you've been met by the living God and something burns within you, and you know, I'm all in. I'm all in. Tonight there are those in the room is what I heard the Father tell me. And he told me, this, Steve, this is who you're going to speak to. There's ones in the room that I've been burning in their hearts, in the deepest place of their hearts. They know it. They don't know what to do with it because it looks crazy. I'm asking them and I'm calling them, the Father said, to do things for me that look crazy. That's where... Faith will sometimes make you look crazy. This is surrender. Can you imagine God visiting you and saying, oh, by the way, I'm, going to, I'm unhappy with the condition of the world, and so I'm going to save your family only, and this is what I want you to do, because I'm going to send rain on the earth and waters, and I'm going to wipe out the earth. I can't... Can you imagine if you were Noah... Like what? Oh, they hadn't seen rain. They didn't know what that looked like. And, and, and the historians say that it took, it, it took Noah over 50 years, 50, 60 years. He was 500 years old when, he began, when God visited him and he began this journey. And it says it took him over 50 years of building a boat of enormous sizes. It looked crazy. It was crazy. I surrender all. It it looks good on paper. Like I read, we we read this and we, we affirm, oh yeah, I'm all in. Until God visits you and you know it's him and it sounds crazy. Did you read, like, read those verses? It says that, (laughs) they quenched fire, escaped the sword, were made strong out of weakness. Women received their dead back by resurrection. The world was not worthy of them. Jesus. Twenty twenty two and twenty twenty three. I was in a season where I felt I was really hungry for God, like really hungry. Do you know what that's like? Where you just go, Jesus, I'm so hungry for you. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Oh, by the way, Steve. That's not hunger for me you're feeling. It's my hunger for you. I was walking around the block on a prayer walk, and I was going, God, I'm so hungry for you. I want more of you. Have you ever prayed that? God, I want more of you. And God goes, oh, no, I'm allowing you to feel my heart. I want more of you. Oh, right away I was changed. I went, oh, my gosh. I can't believe how hungry you are. Like, you're really hungry. I thought I was hungry. And then I thought, how do I satisfy you? How, how, do, I, how, do, I, how do I satisfy your hunger? I 
felt as though there's a scripture that says in Zechariah, he has roused himself from his holy hill. I said, Steve, I'm asking for more. I said, God, you have my yes. I've surrendered. He goes, yeah, but I don't have your no. I said, what are my no's? Mm. Sometimes our no's are unperceived until he points them out. My first no came when my dear friend John Hall said, hey, Steve, I want you to speak at Mission Fest in 2023. And I went, no. I don't want to do that. I'm not a missions guy. And the Lord, I felt the, I felt the eyes of the Lord on me, and it was like, well, I went, oh, you want me to do this? He goes, yeah. So I said to John, okay, I'll do it. And then it got worse. And John said, hey, hey, Steve, can you, we're having a fundraiser. Can you come to the fundraiser and share and take the offering? And I went, I don't take offerings. I'll have to pray about it. Have you ever said that when you know God's spoken to you? I'll pray about it. No, you won't. You're procrastinating from saying yes. And so I said to John, I said to the Lord, this, this, is, what, this is the deal I made with the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm, I am not going to take an offering unless I have a word from you. What's the point of taking an offering for a cause? And then the Lord said, oh, you're not taking an offering for a cause. You're taking an offering so someone else can have an encounter with me. I went, oh, I couldn't wait to break the door down, to get into that restaurant and stand up there and tell them what was on the heart of the Father and take an offering. Where's Tony? Where are you? Remember that, Tony? We took an offering. And it wasn't because we needed the money or you guys needed the money. It was you needed the money, but it was because God wanted an atmosphere where people could have an encounter with him as a person, the living God, and be forever marked and changed. So not only did I say yes to John to speak at the conference last year, then I took an offering, two things I really didn't want to do. But I realized God was asking me for more. And, and this is the thing I've learned about God. When he comes and asks of me something, he's already put it in me, and he's touching it and making it come alive. And when he does that, when that transaction happens and the burningness of God is in you, you know what it's like. There are those of you in this room where God has visited you and asked something from you and it sounded crazy and you might have even said no, but it burns within you. You're in this room. You are. So it came to 2023 Mission Fest. It was actually not called Mission Fest. It was formerly Mission Fest. It was Mission Central Serve. I just, I just love John. Thank you, Lord. And we did the conference, and the conference ended, and it was the closing of the conference. It was a good conference. People's lives were changed, and connections were made, and it was beautiful. And I heard these words from the Lord. These are the last words I heard. 2023, serve. He said, Steve, they come, they visit, they hear good preaching, good words, great stories. They learn new strategies. They raise money, they get new volunteers at their booths, and it's wonderful. But what they really need is my power. I went, oh, they need your power. Because, yeah, they don't need a strategy. They don't need 
an offering. They need my power. And I say, God, that's a great, that's wonderful. That's awesome. They need your power. He goes, yeah, they need my power because they're, they're facing overwhelming odds ahead of them. They're going to face times where I'm going to take them places where they're in over their head. Where all they have is, is my presence and promise never to leave them. I'm going to visit them in days ahead and I'm going to ask them to do things like Noah that are crazy. And without my power, a strategy won't do it. They need my power. And I said, oh God, that's wonderful. I said, that's really good. I said, go get them, Jesus. But it was ending. I had no clue what God was going to do. And on February the 8th, that, that was the end of January, and then on February the 8th, my wife and I were watching on my computer a visitation of God to a small school called Asbury. Anybody watch that? Where all of a sudden, the presence of God started asking students for more, and they flocked. They would gather like this for worship and the presence of God was moving so much in them that they didn't want to leave. They weren't looking at their watch. They weren't worrying about their booth. They weren't wondering what was going to happen for dinner. They weren't wondering if the Canucks were winning tonight. Just a minute, I'm going to check the score. But this sovereign move of God, it wasn't they were, they weren't seeking him. He was seeking them because he wanted his hunger satisfied. And his hunger gets satisfied when he moves on you and he visits you and you are so moved by him and so compelled and caught by his love and his, and his nature that you would do anything to stay in his presence. Anything. You know what the game changer was for Noah? It says in Genesis 6, Noah walked with God. It didn't say he kept the law because there was no law to keep. It says he walked with God. He spent time with God. What, would it, what did that, like you remember when you read the scriptures, you go, what does that look like? He walked with you. We, we read it and we kind of interpret it in our understanding now. Well, you know, I go to Bible study and I go to church. And I, but Noah didn't have that. He walked with him. When I read that, I write the word, Noah was a friend of God. They walked together. They went on a walk. They talked about stuff. You know what it says? Noah was a righteous man, more righteous than all around him. He didn't get that righteousness by keeping rules. He kept it because he was in a relationship with the person of God. He walked with him. And so when God said to Noah, hey, Noah, this is my thought, my plan, they probably talked it over. And they, they walked it out. And they, and Noah goes, yeah, I'm all in. He wasn't doing it to save his skin or because the world was terrible and he was upset and thought, I got to get out of here. He was doing it because his friend told him to do it. So I'm watching Asbury, and I'm watching it, and, and you know, Instagram, right? You, you guys doing Instagram on me right now? Come on. <laughs> and, and there was a guy, at, you know, it was about one in the morning, and it was dark, and it was raining, and he, and he showed, it was Daniel Kalenda, and he goes, I drove all the way from Orlando to Asbury, about eight and a half hours, and people want me to tell them, why would I do such a crazy thing to drive here to see if this move of God was real. 
And he told a story about a guy named Reinhard Bonnke. I don't know if you know, he's a great missionary evangelist to Africa, led over 7 million people, some of the biggest tent crusades ever in the earth were Reinhard Bonnke's. And he, and he made this quote, and I'm just going to cut the short story a little bit short, but he made this quote. I heard him say it. He said, Reinhard taught him a, a simple phrase, and we can put it up on the, on the screen, guys. And it was simply this, I feel the eyes of God are upon me, and I want him to know that when he speaks, I jump. And when I heard that, I went, oh, God, yes. And this is, what, this is the crazy part. My friend John was telling me about and the, you know, the, what was happening with, with Serve and Mission Central. And, <laughs> oh. In my walk with God, he says, I want you to pick this up and not let it die. I went, are you kidding? We don't have any money. And you don't want to owe the government. And you don't, like, God, like, I don't, I'm not a missions guy, and I, I have no plan or strategy. I don't. And then I heard that. And I felt the eyes of God on me. And when I heard that, I was sunk. I was captured. It was like I felt the eyes of God. No, I want you to do this. Oh. I said, God, what do we do? How do we do this? What, what do I tell John? And he said, and it gets worse. Imagine hearing God say this to you. Just say yes, we'll figure it out later. <laughs> no. I want, I want to figure it out and have a plan and a strategy that I can share at a vision conference and we can, we can work this out. And God goes, no, we don't want to do that. No, no, we're not going to do it that way. I want you to know, are you my man? It was not a good idea. So I, I, I phoned up John. I said, John. So we met for lunch on February 16th. What's tomorrow? 16th. <laughs> this is a crazy story. So on February 16th, I met with John at the White Spot in Vancouver, or in, out in Surrey. I said, John, the eyes of the Lord are on me, and I got I to do this. And he was like, wow, what does that look like? And I said, all he said was, say yes, we'll figure it out later. And that sounds a little crazy. That's Hebrews 11. Looks good on paper until he comes to you. <laughs> right? But that's what mission is all about. There's a one booth out here that didn't start 40, 50 years ago with one person being met by God and doing something crazy. And now it's a legacy. But God is visiting the earth and he's got burning ones, beacons in the room, ones that are going to come in over the next few days, some of them that aren't even going to attend this, these gatherings. But they've been met by God and God has spoken to them and told them to do something crazy and it would be a mistake for them to confer first with flesh and blood without going to God and understanding that it's him. And you know who I'm talking about in the room. Where God's asked you to do something that's crazy. So I said to John, okay, what, what, are, we, what are we up against? <laughs> right, Tony? He says, oh yeah, it's, it's, we're about 80,000 in the hole. I go, 80? Oh, I, oh no, sorry, made a mistake. We're 120 in the hole. I went, what do you all know? It's getting worse. But you need to know that when God invites you into something, he's actually gone before you and will come in behind you. But it's not something that you can get confidence from from talking it over with your friends. It's something that you can only get confidence over talking with your friend, the Lord. But he wants to be your friend. He wants you to walk with him like Noah. He wants you to walk like him with Abraham, like Abraham. He wants you to walk like him like Rahab. He wants you to walk like him like Joseph and Paul, 
When Paul was encountered by God, by the person of Jesus on the Damascus Road and it knocked him off his horse, he had a conversation with God. What do you want me to do? There wasn't a moment in that story where he went, oh, this isn't God, this is just too crazy. And that's who I'm talking to tonight, where you know that God has visited you and there's something in your spirit where you know, oh, he's got me. i gotta, I, I got to do this. That was February 16th. <laughs> After I had a really nice lunch with John and set him all in, I woke up on February 17th, scared. <gasps> what have I done? Because I went, I committed now. Like I said, yes. What I learned is sometimes when you say yes to the Lord, the enemy wants to come with as much fear as he can muster up to get you to second guess that God spoke to you and wants you to do something for him. Brought fear. Oh, like what are you going to do? You're on the hook for all this money personally, yourself. It was like, oh, I didn't want to wake my wife. I'm scared. I didn't want her to get scared. Maybe she did. What have we done? So I quickly did what every good godly person does. <laughs> I called my friends and said, hey, this is the crazy idea God told me to do. I need to walk with my friends. I need, I need you guys to walk with me. And they did. And then within, within a, you know, the, John and the team had put out words to try to finish, to finish well. And a week after, maybe two weeks after, get the timing right, we said yes. By the end of February, we, we became the new board in March, but by, by that time, the Lord paid off the whole debt. But it wasn't to validate my faith. It was to validate him. He was on the move. He was stirring. He was doing something. And it wasn't just a good idea. It was a God thing. And what I'm learning in all of this is that faith isn't spelled risk. Risk is when you hedge the bet. Well, you know, if we do this and we have this plan, then maybe it'll work. We can, maybe we can pull this off. Well, you don't need God for that. I'm learning that faith, it like, like I, didn't, I didn't know this, but I had been, been raised and taught, not so much raised, but taught in Christendom that faith is spelled risk. You risk for God. And then I was at a men's retreat, February 16th, no, I, that, that weekend, so it was the 19th on and I said, Jesus, and actually James was with me. Where are you, James? James was with me. And I said, Jesus, what do, what do I tell these men? What's one thing you want me to tell them on their heart? And he said, oh, tell them that faith isn't spelled risk. It's spelled trust. Because risk is about the odds and the circumstance. Trust is about a person. So faith in a person is lived out in trust. Risk is considering what lies ahead and figuring out how to do it. Like in your, if you're in a card game and you're going to risk, sometimes you want to just, like, I'm not going to put all in, but trust is all in. It says in Hebrews 11, they considered him. Abraham considered that when he, uh, can, can you imagine your son taking him up a hill and he said, it's my friend asking me this, and I've walked with him. And if he's asking me this, and I go through with it, my friend has the power to raise him from the dead. And I'm putting my faith in my friend that has the power. And you know what the Bible says about Abraham? Oh, it's crazy. It says, he saw Abraham take Isaac up there and, on the mountain, and it says, 
he saw that Abraham was willing to follow through and he stayed his hand and he said, there's a ram in the thicket, pulls the ram out. But this, God says this about Abraham. Now I know that he's all in. Now I know that he will withhold nothing from my hand. I surrender all. Oh. The gospel's full of those kind of stories. Encountered a person. There's a quote that says this, great faith only really exists where the answer is yet to be seen. We're here doing Mission Fest on February 15, 16, and 17. You know another crazy part of this story? James, as the engineer of it, and he's been organizing it all, felt the dates that the Lord told him were uh, January 24, anniversary of 40 years. And those dates weren't available. Because, you know, we, we, we have no money. So he asked different churches who would be willing to trust that we've heard God and God wants to do this. And Westside said yes. They're a crazy bunch. And as James said to me, hey, the dates got changed. What do you think of February 15, 16, and 17? And I said, what? 16th of February? That's the exact one-year anniversary that I sat down with John and said, yes, we're going to do this. Like, who plans that? It wasn't us. You're here on the exact weekend of the anniversary of crazy people saying yes to a crazy idea that was in over their head with overwhelming odds because we walk with Jesus and we want to satisfy him. And in his friendship with us, he comes to us with infallible proofs and signs to validate himself that when we follow him into crazy and into the unseen and the unknown, that as our best friend, he is waiting there to prove himself strong. I don't know if it gets any better. It's an amazing thing. This weekend, we were, well, actually downstairs an hour and a half ago. We were talking with all the, the ones that are on the heart of God to speak to you guys over the next two and a half days. And I looked around this room and I went, these are a bunch of crazy people. But we're, that are just crazy enough to do what God is asking them to do, no matter what it looks like. That's I surrender. You want to know another crazy thing? I said to James, so... What's, what do you, what's, what's God saying about collecting offerings? He goes, we're not collecting offerings on Thursday night. Okay. Why? Because money is not our leader. And if he tells us not to take an offering on Thursday night, then he doesn't want us to stress or worry about that. Can you believe that? Crazy. Hmm. I said, I asked the father what was on his heart tonight. And he said, I want to prove myself strong on behalf of those who believe in me. 
I want to do that. I want to prove myself strong to those that I have been talking to and moving and that I'm burning in their heart. And they know I'm, I'm calling them into the unknown and I'm burning in their spirit and they're a little bit afraid. I want to meet them tonight. I want to meet the ones that know they have a call on their life and it scares them because the enemy has come to try to steal that promise of God over their life that if they go this way, they'll look, they'll look foolish. And so we're going we're gonna to close here in a minute. And this is what we're going to do If you're here tonight and you're one of the ones that you know the Father has, burn, is, has lit a fire and he's burning in you and he's asking of you for more, I want you to get up and I want you to come down here and our prayer team wants to meet with you and pray with you and bless you with the seal of the Holy Spirit to come with power to walk by faith and not by sight. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Like, whoa, he's talking about me. But I don't want to go down there and be the only one. That would look crazy. What will people think if I do this? My friend James, he's up here, you know, we were talking. You know what he does? Yeah, you come. The, 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 he said, oh, Jesus just told me to lay on the floor flat. And I go, oh. He goes, yeah, I feel, stu I feel stupid doing it, but I have to do it because the eyes of the Lord are on him. Let's, every, let's just all stand. Come on. This is crazy. We're doing an altar call at a missions fest, and it's not to go to the ends of the world. Maybe it is to go to the ends of the world. One of the things that James and I were talking about, about this, what we felt sense was on the heart of God, that you're going to come to these meetings, and something inside of you is going to go, I, I'm going to Africa. We've talked to people that, other, that have attended other Mission Fest gatherings and something has burned within them and they made a life decision to follow Jesus and go to the ends of the earth and they went. So we're just going to say right now, if you, if you feel like this is out of our comfort zone, but if you feel the fire of God burning in you and you want him to know that you feel the eyes of the Lord are on you, and you want him to know that when he's speaking to you, you'll jump. Then I want you to come so that we can meet you and pray for you and bless the fire of God, the person of God in your life, and that he would become so alive to you that you would surrender everything to him, even if it looks crazy. So, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus oh, that you would begin to stir the burning ones in the room. We're not doing this to show or see or anything, but, Lord, the burning ones. We want to do some business with you, God. Lord, you are looking for a generation, not of age, but of those who know the Lord and aren't worried about how bad the world is, but, Lord, they, they know his glory is rising in the earth and I sense it in me, and I want to be in the middle of the display of his glory. But Father, I ask that you would just move over us that way. And Lord, over this next two days, Lord, that burning ones would respond 
and their hearts would be lit on fire. And they would be added to the list of Hebrews 11. The world wasn't worthy of them. Now the key about this is don't come because you go, oh, I'd like that. Come because you know it's in you and you want that, that, what is ignited in you. You want the Father to, to like fan that flame in your life. You're the ones we want to pray for tonight. Mm. So, so it's nine o'clock. We're going to release everyone to go if you want. But if you want that kind of prayer, because you know God has been stirring you, it's been frustrating, it's been confusing, you've wondered what it means, you've actually suppressed it because it looks crazy and you haven't wanted to tell anybody. You come. The rest, you can go to the booths and enjoy that and that's, there's a blessing of God on that too and we'll see you again tomorrow morning. Take a look at your schedules. But Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would begin to burn in us by your Spirit. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 There are people that are going to shake the earth in this room. Yeah, you come. You come. We need more prayer people here. You know what the thing is? It's not just sometimes the prayer people are the ones that are burning and they need prayer. That's okay too. Just put your hand up for me. If, like if, you're, if, you've, if you've been moved by God tonight and you want prayer, just put your hand up right here. So we need some prayer people right over here. Anybody? I don't, if there's other people in the audience that want to come and pray for these ones, and you come and pray for these ones. It's not an exclusive thing where it's prayer people only. We're going to pray for the, the, the ones that are burning, where there's something that's happening in their spirit, and we want to fan that flame and bless them with the, with the fire and the power of God in their lives. That's right. Just begin to pray in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, come, Lord. Release your power among us, God. Release your power among us, God. Release your power among us, God. Are you going to sing? Okay. In the name of Jesus, we bless you, Father.